Good one. Thank you so much for being here. The off season is over. June 1 is a good time for us to take stock of how we are all progressing and getting ready for the next hurricane. There's a bit of a misconception out there that the hurricane off season is our least busy time here at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, but it's uh, not the case. We've been extremely busy over the last several months. In general, working with our partners to try to get better at what we do and serve the public even more effectively this year than ever before. In the very room in which you're sitting right now, we conducted numerous training courses for federal, state, and local emergency managers as we do every hurricane off-season. A number of international meteorologists, National Weather Service meteorologists from here in the U.S. have been in here for training courses and conferences, all designed to get us all on the same page on how we're going to be serving the public together in the next hurricane and uh, getting to know one another even better. It is so vital that we as government partners mm -hmm. and partnering with our media that we know one another really well so that we can work together and provide a consistent message to the public when a hurricane approaches. And we hope that all of this is instilling confidence in the public, in their government, and with our partners so that they get ready for the next hurricane as well. Because all of the things that we need to do to keep the public safe won't realize their full potential unless individuals, families, and businesses have also gotten themselves ready in advance. So hitting some of the highlights on what we've been doing this hurricane off season, the forecasts and the warnings from the National Weather Service, including here at the Hurricane Center, do not flow unless our technology is working. The technology and science branch, TSB at the Hurricane Center, uh, the talented folks there, multi-talented folks have been working hard to get our data flows and our computers upgraded, our networking ready to go, and we're ready to carry out that mission. And within TSB is our storm surge unit. And we are very excited to be uh, calling operational today our potential storm surge flooding map. This is a game-changing new way for us to communicate the deadliest hurricane hazard of all, storm surge, in real time. It will be issued this year if and when we have a hurricane watch or even tropical storm watch first issued for any part of the Gulf or East Coast of the United States. And it will show everyone just how far from the beach, how far inland the storm surge flooding could go, how high above normally dry ground the storm surge flooding could go. And our emergency management partners have incorporated this into their exercises. It has, be, it has become part of the training courses that we conducted uh, this hurricane off season. And I want to acknowledge several folks who here at the Hurricane Center have made this happen. Uh, Jamie Rome, who is our storm surge unit uh, team leader, and William Booth, who's been the lead technical developer on this new product. Uh, Dan Brown, James Franklin, our hurricane specialist unit, who have worked with our storm surge unit folks to conduct upgraded, enhanced training courses that incorporate this new product. And so we are ready to utilize this heavily tested, heavily vetted new product in real time. And the public needs to know that there's a part for them to play to make that product as effective as it can be. Find out today if you live in a hurricane storm surge evacuation zone. And if you do, Decide today where you go and how you get there if told to evacuate by your local emergency manager. And if you don't live in one of these hurricane evacuation zones, then find someone you care about who does and work out today to be their inland evacuation destination. Because when this new graphic is issued and emergency managers are making evacuation decisions and through our media partners, the public is seeing where the storm surge could occur in a particular tropical storm or hurricane. The ultimate goal of this new graphic is to increase the chances that when emergency managers tell you to go in the public, that you go. And there is graphic number two this year from the National Hurricane Center. It's our experimental prototype storm surge watch warning graphic. It's not an actual watch or warning. That will happen in 2017 if we stay on target. But it will show where we as National Weather Service forecasters, Hurricane Center and local forecasters, local forecast offices, where we are designating areas that have a significant chance of life-threatening storm surge. We have an effective communications tool for the deadliest hurricane hazard of all. 
-hmm. If you don't know, here at the Hurricane Center, we are co-located in this building with the local forecast office of the National Weather Service for South Florida. And Dr. Pablo Santos, their meteorologist in charge, is here with us today. And he can answer any questions that you might have later on with regard to how we handle things at the local level at forecast offices around the country. The collaboration between the Hurricane Center and the local offices is very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and some of his staff, like some of the staff on the Hurricane Center side, uh, are bilingual as well for those who are Spanish-speaking media. So we have worked very closely with our partners. Our hurricane specialists have been spreading out around the country, conducting training and attending conferences. Our marine forecasters, the largest branch here at the Hurricane Center, our tropical analysis and forecast branch, TAF-B, they've been meeting with partners uh, from the cruise ship industry, the cargo industry uh, that does shipping, and the Coast Guard and other partners on uh, helping them understand uh, the forecasts and warnings that we issue for keeping people safe out at sea, which is just as important as keeping people safe on land. And so we've done everything we can with our partners to get ready for this hurricane season, including getting ourselves ready. We don't just work at the Hurricane Center, we live the hurricane problem. And so I've been getting myself, my family, my home ready for the next hurricane because all of this stuff that we do together as government partners and in partnership with media and other organizations, it doesn't reach its full potential without us as individuals planning in advance. So I've done my insurance checkup. I'm making my home as strong as it can be, checking my shutters. I am doing whatever I can to get all the supplies I need now, not wait till the hurricane is on our doorstep. But if you're new to the hurricane problem, or if you haven't thought about hurricane preparations in a long time, start with the evacuation question. Storm surge is the deadliest hazard of all. We have already provided our emergency management partners with an analysis of what storm surge could occur, and they've prescribed evacuation zones. Find out from your local emergency manager if you live in one of these evacuation zones. We talked with President Obama yesterday, Administrator Fugate and I did, about how we are getting ready to ensure as best we can that people evacuate when they're told to do so. And that is the most important message we can convey today. It's the main reason we have come up with this new potential storm surge flooding map. And we don't do all of this forecasting alone. I want to acknowledge so many bright minds uh, in other parts of NOAA and the National Weather Service and in the academic community who have helped us to bring forth the most advanced computer forecasting modeling capabilities so our human forecasters have the best guidance they can possibly have. The Hurricane Weather Research and Forecast Model, for example, developed uh, by many folks, including here in the Miami area, the Hurricane Research Division, HRD, which is part of AOML, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. They worked with folks at the Environmental Modeling Center up in Washington, D.C., and many other partners as part of the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project to get us another advancement in the Hurricane Morph model that we use that has really advanced its capability in forecasting intensity and structure. Last three years it was our leading intensity model. So we're, we're tapping into the brightest minds to make the most accurate forecasts and warnings that we possibly can. And with our partners that you see here today, doing everything we can to keep people safe this hurricane season. But again, it starts with you at home, individuals, families, and businesses getting themselves ready in advance for the next hurricane. And so. I'd like to give the opportunity for some of our partners to speak because we really appreciate the support of emergency managers, elected officials, and many others who we work with all the time. And here locally, uh, I'm uh, honored to live in the same district, 23, uh, the U.S. Uh, Florida district that uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, presides over, and we're thrilled to have her here today and to help us get the message out about getting residents ready for this hurricane season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nab. And I was just going to return the uh, mutual admiration and say how proud I am to, to have the director of the National Hurricane Center as a petition um, and that you are leading the charge to make sure that we can keep our residents safe, uh, both here locally and, and all across the country. Um, it's also good to see Director Fugate, who uh, is, is one of our locals that, uh, that has gone national, and it's always really good to see him back here in, in, uh, in South Florida. Um, 
I've just come from my annual briefing with the emergency management team that works all across the state of Florida to make sure that we can get ready for hurricane season. And uh, one of the really uh, fascinating and important things that I learn each year is the incredibly important technological tools that both NOAA and the National Hurricane Center and the National Work Weather Service work together towards developing so that we can make sure that they can improve the forecasting and the predictability for our residents so that we, one, know as far out as possible that we are going to have a storm, that it may or may not hit, make landfall, and that the intensity is more predictable. Those are all things that, for me as a member of the Appropriations Committee, you know, I work every day to provide NOAA and the Hurricane Center with the resources they need to be able to make sure that they can continue to develop those tools. Uh, but this year in particular, you know, we've seen a really um, important increase in their ability to use tools like the evacuation uh, tool that they've developed, the, the forecasting and the more clear graphics that they're using on the impact of flooding and the emphasis that they're making on stressing that, you know, most people think of a hurricane and the danger that is the most significant being wind, when the reality is, is most of the deaths that, and injuries take place from significant flooding. So that's incredibly important. And evacuation planning is incredibly important as well. And I would commend the media to a graphic that shows a family standing in the colored levels of flood risk, because you can see it and for me as a mom, seeing the smallest child you know, who would be really Im fully immersed in water to the top of their head in the, in the, smallest, uh, in the, in the smallest surge is, is really important to get your mind wrapped around as a resident what you need to do and whether you need to evacuate. And really every time I come here, you know, I know um, and realize how fortunate that we are in South Florida to have such highly qualified and dedicated teams of experts keeping us safe. Um, we know in South Florida we're really ground zero when it comes to climate change and sea level rise and so the disproportionate impact that we feel as a result of the, the onset of a storm is, uh, is important for us to make sure that we're even more aware of this. Um, we do have a near normal hurricane forecast that was issued by NOAA, uh, but in spite of that forecast, we know in Florida that we have you know, at, at least a thousand residents moving to, to our state every single day. And as we talked about in, the, our briefing early, in my briefing earlier, you, know, you might have someone who moves to the state in March. And you know, today is the beginning of hurricane season on June 1st. Um, they would get the information that they needed, hopefully, because we're vigilant. And that's when most of it is distributed and highlighted at the beginning of hurricane season. But what if you move to the state in August, you know, right when we Typically, if we're going to experience an intense hurricane, right in the, in the part of the hurricane season that it makes landfall. We have to make sure that we are using ways to educate our residents every single day, all throughout the year. And we can't be complacent, because just because we haven't had a hurricane make landfall in Florida for 11 years, uh, doesn't mean that it can't happen at any time on any day during hurricane season. We know it just takes one major storm one, to really completely upend the lives of residents and, and, our, and our visitors all, all across the state. Uh, and our emergency management officials are working every day all across the state of Florida to prevent loss, and lo loss of life and limit any property damage. And that's why it's the absolute imperative. Our, each of us needs to take personal responsibility for those hurricane preparations. We need to make sure that we're not doing it when we start hearing on the news for the weather forecasts, that, uh, that it's time to get ready, that it's time to prepare your hurricane kit. You have to do that months in advance. You want to make sure that you know your pathway out when you are living in an evacuation zone, not trying to figure out what road you take and further add to the congestion that ultimately results from people getting a little nervous and maybe panicking and clogging our roads and, and because they're unfamiliar with uh, the direction they have to go. We all have to make sure that we're working together. And speaking of working together, um, this is something that, uh, that, that I want to continue to stress. The Red Cross is a critical partner when it comes to the aftermath of a storm in particular. And so they need volunteers 
If you are able to volunteer to be a part of the response team that the Red Cross deploys, please, con please contact them either on their website or at 305-644-1200, extension 2131, and please sign up to be a volunteer to help the Red, Red Cross. But all of us should be talking and working with our family, our friends, create an emergency preparedness kit. Make sure you know what your policy covers. Those are all things that we take for granted every day and don't think about until you are pushing the panic button because you really need to know. We cannot wait until a storm is coming. We have to have a recovery plan. You have to make sure that you do what it takes to secure your property in advance. And if we learned anything from the aftermath of Hurricane Wilma, it is that it is our responsibility. Because previously to Wilma, too many families thought, okay, it's gonna be the government's responsibility to make sure to, that I can be taken care of for those 72 hours following a storm. No, that 72 hour period, our emergency management officials need to be securing property, need to make sure that they can keep people safe, and you need to be responsible as, as a Florida resident to have what you need to take care of yourself, your water, your food, your, your, uh, you, you know, all, all the things that you are going to need to make sure that you can not only sustain yourself, but take care of the needs that you're going to have in, in that 72 hours afterwards. A three-day supply of non-perishable food and water, batteries, flashlights, and radios, a full tank of gas. Uh, again, planning now will help you to be prepared later. So thankfully, we haven't had a, a storm hit us recently. Um, that's all the way since 2005, but we know we can't take it for granted. We have you know, lived uh, in, in Hurricane Alley for, uh, for far too long to, to be complacent and we need to make sure that we're vigilant each and every year, and I thank the National Hurricane Center for always giving us this opportunity to send the alert out to our residents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also wanted to mention some of the, the tips and ideas for how to get prepared for the next hurricane have been part of our Hurricane Strong campaign in collaboration with the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. So go to hurricanestrong.org, go to hurricanes.gov slash prepare, and go to ready.gov. A lot of resources out there to get a full list of things that you can be doing now to get ready for the next hurricane. Now, to talk about what emergency managers are doing to get ready for the hurricane season, Administrator Craig Fugate from FEMA. Uh, thanks, Rick. You know, one of the things I learned a long time ago as a, as a government official, we talk about disasters, I'm supposed to reassure the public we're doing everything we can, and when disaster happens, we're gonna make everything okay. I don't wanna give you those assurances because that's a false assurance. I'm the guy that always says, but. Because yesterday, as Rick is briefing the president on the improved accuracy of the forecast and the new tools and how we can get better information, I had to go, but Mr. President, it doesn't mean there won't be significant impacts and damages when the storms hit. It doesn't prevent them. It only gives us better information about the risk. And what we had to remind the president yesterday at the briefing as as we get ready and he knows this, and so he's a great messenger. No matter what we do to get ready, the leading cause of death in hurricanes is not wind. But for some reason in Florida, we think wind's what we got to get ready for. What kills people is water. And the most preventable of those deaths occur from storm surge. That water that comes up faster than any high tide you ever saw, with wave action that is a battering ram, that is not just merely getting wet, but becomes right threatening. The only response is to evacuate. And that's why we spend so much time emphasizing, if you live from Brownsville, Texas, to the New England states, along the coast and major lakes and rivers of the coastal regions, your first step of getting ready for hurricane season is find out, do I live in an evacuation zone? And if you do, your plans to evacuate. The family, the pets, those things that are irreplaceable to you, which are not your possessions, need to move to higher ground. And for a lot of folks, that's just going inland a couple of miles. But I've seen this happen too many times. People wait. People go, I've lived here all my life. It's never been that bad. I'm the guy that goes to get those people to hear this, and they go, but I never knew it could be this bad. We tried to tell you, 
But here's what we face. We still run the risk of losing hundreds of lives if people don't evacuate in a hurricane. Now think about that. All the technology, all the forecast, everything we do to get ready, all the exercises, all the drills will not change the outcome if people don't evacuate. All the investments that the Congresswoman talked about, the fact they fully fund FEMA for disaster response and we're not having to go back and get money every couple of months, the things they do to make sure government's ready, all the forecasting, it will not change the outcome if people don't evacuate. Unlike many other hazards, this is one we spend the most money and time on identifying the at-risk populations, the evacuation zones, and we beat the drum. To me, this is Groundhog Day. Everybody says it's June 1st, and oh, this is the movie Groundhog Day. We may have new tools, new technology, social media. The message doesn't change. People need to heed the evacuation orders, and they need to heed them when they're given by those local officials and not wait, because waiting can be deadly. I've listened to the 911 calls. Remember Hurricane Ivan when it hit Scambia County? We got copies of the tapes of the 911 center, people calling in during the storm. They were on the barrier islands. They had waited. They said, I've lived here all my life. It's never that bad. It would have been tragic if it was just an individual making that decision. They had their families with them. And the dispatchers could only tell them to hold on and good luck. We'll get to you as soon as we can, but we can't get to you. The storm is in the way. It's too dangerous. That's why we talk about evacuation. That's why we spend so much time every year doing this. We have got to figure out what is that magic code word phrase to get people to evacuate. You're part of that team. <clears throat> We're trying to develop the tools and products, but you're the messengers. You get out there and people trust you. They know you. That's why we tell them, don't turn to your national affiliates in a crisis. Turn to the local stations because you're talking to the local emergency managers. You know what's going on in your communities, and you can help convey that. But no matter how much we do, no matter how much we work on this, we cannot change the outcome if people don't act. They have to evacuate. That is our message. That's the president's message. That's from the team. We've got to get people to understand. Don't go by hope. Don't go by experience. Just go to higher ground with the evacuation orders given. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator Fugate. And there is something called the National Hurricane Program partnership between NOAA, FEMA, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And with our state emergency management partners, we work on putting the tools in the hands of the local emergency managers who are making these evacuation decisions. And one of those uh, state-level partners is the state director of Florida Division of Emergency Management, also the president of the National Emergency Management Association, Mr. Brian Kuhn. Thanks, Rick. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here today. You know, I just came from an event with the governor across town where we talked about Florida's readiness for hurricane season. That same kind of event is happening everywhere from Texas to Maine today. It's happening at the state level. It's happening at the county level. It's happening at the city level. And we do those events because we want to reassure the public that we have spent the last several months doing the work at the governmental level, doing the training, doing the exercises, doing the preparedness, doing the coordination. We work with our stakeholders at all levels of government, with our nonprofit organization partners, with our National Guard, with our utilities, uh, with all of the different governmental agencies necessary to help us get through this next hurricane season. However, as Craig mentioned, that alone is not going to make us successful during the next hurricane. We do not have enough governmental resources to protect everybody. There are 7 million people living in southeast Florida. There's 20 million people in Florida. There's 100 plus million people in hurricane prone states across the United States. If we do not have the citizens in those areas take the personal responsibility for themselves, their families, for their businesses, for their communities, we will not be successful and we will lose lives and we will lose more property than we need to. So we need everybody who sees this today to take those appropriate actions. Do those life safety things that everyone has talked about thus far to make sure that you're fine for the first 72 hours. Do those things that are going to help you recover once the storm has passed. Take a look at your insurance coverage and make sure that once you get back home and you see that hole in your roof or you see the flooding that you've sustained, that you're going to be adequately prepared to help rebuild your home and get your life back to normal. Do those kinds of things that are going to help benefit your friends and neighbors. Talk to people about hurricane season. Talk to people in your civic organization, in your church groups, and in your business. Help them understand the importance of getting ready. Talk about the websites and those different 
resources that are out there uh, so they can get themselves they're ready. Volunteer with organizations who are going to desperately need your support so you can get your community back up on your feet after that storm passes. That's only through those kinds of efforts by those people who are able to help themselves in these situations that we're going to be able to help all of those who can't help themselves. And that's where we really need to focus our resources in these situations. Getting the information out there for everybody and taking those scarce governmental and, and uh, volunteer resources and helping those who could not help themselves in that situation. So thanks again for helping us get the word out there, everybody. Thank you. Uh, questions? Anybody? And, and also, be, be, quickly before we go to questions, I did want to mention you know, that we, we did have in our, in our media release that uh, Leslie Chapman Henderson, uh, the, the CEO and president of Flash Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, uh, would be here. She couldn't be here today, but I can be pretty confident in saying if she were here today, she would want to point you to HurricaneStrong.org and on Twitter, hashtag HurricaneStrong. And the themes that we've been talking about with that campaign are many of the themes we've been talking about here today and that were part of National Hurricane Preparedness Week a couple of weeks ago, and that is evacuation planning, updating your insurance, buying your supplies, and strengthening your home, and then when you've gotten yourself ready, help your neighbor. And that's what all the partnerships here represent, but it really comes down to a community level where we can help one another, especially those who aren't as able to get themselves ready on their own, to help them get ready. So, Great. Dennis, we can open up to questions. Sure. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I know you had a lot of them before. You're kidding. I'll, yes. I'll start. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Director Fugate, if I could. Um, uh, identify yourself, please. Director Fugate, Wes Hohenstein uh, from CBS North Carolina in Raleigh. And a lot of the focus today has been spent on our coastal counties. Um, we are inland, and it's also been a long time since we've had a big hit. What would you remind our inland residents as they prepare for hurricane season? Well, I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, so I'm in the same situation. I didn't live on the coast. It doesn't mean hurricanes don't strike well inland. But the big difference is you very rarely inland evacuate from the impacts of the hurricane, with the exception of perhaps flooding from the heavy rainfall. But as we've seen, and this is, I think, what, you know, we're talking about the storm surge product, what we're really seeing the Hurricane Center moving towards, which from an emergency management perspective is very helpful to the inland areas, is the impacts of a hurricane, not just relying upon a hurricane warning. If you can remember a long time ago, we didn't even talk about hurricanes inland. It was just a bad storm. Now we have the Hurricane Center working in local offices really talking about the impacts of a hurricane. Uh, there's different parts of the Weather Service that talk about the heavy rainfalls, the tornado risk. And so we have to remind people, some of the most deadly events that have occurred in hurricanes weren't on the coast. They were well inland from the heavy rains that occurred and the flooding that was devastating. I mean, you go all the way back to Hurricane Camille, we lost about as many people in the Appalachians as we did on the Gulf Coast well inland. So again, that's why when we talk about hurricanes, we talk about what do you evacuate from? Coastal, storm surge. But for everybody else, it's about the impacts of the storm. They can go well inland. And again, the Hurricane Center has continued to evolve to put better products out there talking about impacts of storms. So we communicate not to those people that are just on the coast, but people that may be impacted by the storm. And again, through the partnership of all of the, all of the uh, local emergency manager state directors, we talk about this. We have all the different centers online. So we get it. We just want to really focus on the first ones up, or those coastal residents need to evacuate, but the inland residents need to pay attention on those impacts as well. Other questions? Hi, Jenny Stiletovich with the Herald, and this is for anybody on the storm surge maps. How far out are you going to get the information that you can then relate to the locals? Like, the, um, you know, there's a five-day track, three-day track, one of these, these maps. Okay, so the new operational potential storm surge flooding map would first be issued when we go to a hurricane watch or maybe even a tropical storm watch for any part of the Gulf Coast or East Coast of the U.S. And then it would be updated with every subsequent advisory after that. Uh, the graphic itself uh, would be available 45 to 60 minutes or so after uh, the release of the advisory itself so we can do uh, the post-processing required. Uh, we run the storm surge model hundreds and hundreds of times on the supercomputer post-process it in a GIS environment and then disseminate it uh, via our website. It will have a zoom and pan capability down to the community level, not down to the house level. And uh, that will be just graphic number one. There is graphic number two, the experimental uh, prototype storm surge watch warning graphic. They will be issued together. Um, and the graphic will only be issued if we have a threat for storm surge from a tropical storm or hurricane, the Gulf Coast or East Coast of the United States. 
Next question. Yes, sir. Dr. Nash, uh, my clients at uh, ABC and West Palm. Can you talk about the computer models, especially the intensity issue and your expectations for 2016? Well, intensity forecasting continues to be our highest priority forecast improvement need, especially in cases of rapid intensification and especially when it happens near the coast. That's our, our biggest worry. Uh, the last uh, few years we've seen uh, by the raw numbers, the intensity forecast errors come down a little bit, but we haven't had as many of the major hurricanes and rapid intensifiers uh, that we might see, so we're not yet sure if that's a permanent trend downward in the intensity forecast uh, errors going down. Uh, but we continue to uh, have the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project, multi-million dollar, multi-year uh, program to enhance uh, computer forecast models, including, as I mentioned, the Hurricane Wharf. Uh, that's a fully dynamical hurricane model run by the National Weather Service. And you know, the last three years, it has been our best performing intensity model. And it has been uh, updated a little bit for 2016, uh, doing some retrospective runs. It, it even has uh, lower errors in its track forecast with the new version as compared to uh, the last few years. So uh, we hope that in the next several years, that as the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project continues, we'll continue to make some progress uh, toward improving not only our intensity forecast, but our track forecast as well. But the hurricane specialists use a wide variety of models for their track and intensity forecasts, and that's where the humans come in to make the best decision on the forecast that they can on the official forecast, because models are like people. They have different personalities. They have good days and bad days, and it's the human forecaster that's issuing the official forecast and with these new products uh, conveying the, the hazards that could occur given the remaining uncertainties in the forecast. That's what we want people focusing on, is on the hazards and what we're conveying in our products. Yes. Hey there, good morning. Uh, Karen German with CBS 12 in West Palm. This question, I believe, is for Mr. Fugate. Um, we spoke briefly about the um, storm surge impact and evacuation zones earlier when I got a chance to speak with you. If you could just clarify um, that information being passed along through the emergency alert system, is that going to cell phones now? Or yeah, what will happen is when the local officials determine that they're going to order an evacuation, that goes out under the header of civil emergency message, and that would trigger the wireless emergency alerts for cell phones. So it isn't the product going out, it's the decision of local officials to order evacuations. And so this is an enhancement to the emergency alert system. You know, the traditionally was just radio, television, and cable. We now have, and we've had this capability going back to, to uh, post-tropical storm Sandy, to now send out urgent life-saving messages from local officials in the weather service. And so for hurricanes, evacuation would be one of those messages that would go out over the cell phones. There's not a lot of information there because it's only 120 characters, but it tells you you are in an evacuation zone and you need to get better, more information. And if you have your plan, it's now time to go. Thank you. Can I add something else that um, they raised in the briefing today? Um, while we're improving the forecasting ability and the predictability and, you know, the, these experts really try to get as far out as they can from when a storm might make landfall, what they did stress was that, like Hurricane Katrina, every, we don't have five days for, for every storm that, that develops. And so, you know, if you have a storm that develops closer to the shoreline, you're going to have a much more narrow window of time, and that's why uh, preparation in advance in spite of the tools that we're developing and in spite of the improvements and length of time that we have for predictability of landfall and intensity of the storms, we still have to make sure we're prepared because we don't have the ability to predict where a, a, and how close to, to the shore a storm is going to form. And, and that gives me an opportunity to uh, update you on our progress toward being able to issue forecasts and watches and warnings prior to the formation of the tropical cyclone. Uh, most of you know we have our five-day graphical tropical weather outlook uh, and on the Atlantic Gulf Caribbean side. It'll be issued every six hours from now through November, showing you uh, where the next depressions and storms could form out to five days. So that gives us some idea of where the next systems could be forming, even if that is uh, close to the coastline. And right now we continue to work on and are targeting for 2017 having the ability uh, to issue our full-blown five-day forecasts and National Weather Service tropical storm and hurricane watches and warnings 
uh, even if a system is not yet a tropical cyclone, but it's within the watch warning time frame and could impact land within that time frame, and the chances of it forming are high. So uh, that is something that we hope to have in our arsenal starting next year, and it could include the storm surge warning too, as that's targeted for 2017 as well. A couple more questions. Anybody? Photographers? No? All right. Uh, I want to thank everyone in the media for partnering with us to get the word out because, again, all the technologies that we've talked about today, all the new tools, again, aren't going to realize their full potential unless people have prepared in advance. We want to be hurricane strong by taking steps now. Again, this is a personal, emotional issue for us, not just a professional issue for us. I want to get my family ready in advance. Don't wait till the last minute when the things you need to do to get ready are going to be more difficult, more expensive, if not impossible to do. Preparing in advance, you know what you're going to do when the hurricane's approaching. You'll survive the event and get life back to normal in the aftermath. Thank you to all of our partners for being here, and we <coughs> hope to not talk to you too many times as the hurricane season goes forward, but we're ready to do so and carry out our mission. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.